So when we're drawing a cylinder, we know that uh, this is a way to, to, to draw it, as it were. Two ellipses, two ovals, joined together in this way. We see, don't we, a, a cylinder, something which has the appearance of something three-dimensional. There it is, a tube. That we know. We also learned that when you want to show a cylinder on its side, then something like this occurs. When it comes to the fingers and the toes, or other parts of the uh, human anatomy which are facing towards the viewer, something like that has to be held in mind. For example, um, here is a perfect example, the knee, the thigh, the knee sitting on a sitting position would be something like that. We feel the, the, the cylinder of the upper thigh comes to a, a smaller point at the knee and then we're seeing a cylinder of sorts in the lower leg. Same with a, a, a finger, it might be pointing towards us or a toe, shall we say. We see something larger here, and the circles that describe the, the volume of the cylinder uh, are decreasing in this case, and so the, the digit moves towards us. The nail often helps us to see the, uh, the final point. So here we have a series of cylinders which describe the digit but they are getting smaller as they advance, and so let's make this a toenail, it would be something like that. So broader here and narrower until we come to the tip. So when things come towards us, they are cylinders, uh, but we know how to use the idea of a, an ellipse or an oval joined together, uh, as, as in this case, but with a cylinder like the finger, it's getting narrower towards the tip, and so things have to change slightly. But it's the same principle of uh, solid geometry, where a cylinder is seen on its side. So we have to bear that in mind when we're drawing something as complex as the hand, because it's capable of moving towards us in this way. And, and the feet, too, on the ground tend to be moving towards us, uh, which creates a certain uh, problem with drawing, which we have to bear in mind. All right. So when it comes to the hand and feet, I think the best thing to do is not to worry too much about individual muscles and bones and naming them, as we've done elsewhere in uh, the study of anatomy and drawing, but rather to think in terms of what I'll call units. And I'll show you what I mean. The first one will be just the wrist itself. Uh, which is really uh, the two bones, the radius and the ulna, form a, a distinct line uh, at the wrist there and are seen rather as a, a rectangular form. I'll show you what I mean. Uh, it'd be more like this. And we'll call that unit one. The second unit is this, the, the, the carpal bones. Um, here they are, the back of the hand. Um, they are, um, they form a, another, as it were, rectangular shape, something like this, but rather curved in this way. Uh, I would say like a chocolate bar, but one which is slightly molten. It's, it's, it's con, convex in this case here. Yeah. And then something wonderful happens. Then from rectangular shapes, we get uh, the, the phalanges, which is posh name for fingers, which are, of course, tubulous. Uh, and, and, and here's something which it's difficult to, to talk about in any other way than something which is just rather beautiful and rather strange, because there's a kind of wiggle, because at each joint, the, the digit, the phalange, gets a little bit thicker and then has a waist, a, 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 a thin, thins out until it comes to the second or the third uh, knuckle, as it were. And so you get something which I would call a wiggle, show you what I mean. And it's something which you just, I think you have to practice. And every finger is 
different, but um, and they form a kind of fanning out, don't they, uh, like this. The fingernail is very important um, because I consider this. If I hold my hands like this and put something on them like that, there is a, a bit of charcoal which is on the same plane as the floor and my fingernails are pointing to the ceiling. Um, when I come to talk about the thumb, you'll see that the fingernail or the thumbnail is at right angles to the fingernails. Think of a piano where one of the keys is turned completely on its side. Uh, we must never think of the thumb uh, in, the, in the same way uh, as we think of the fingers, that is, in the same, at the same time. We must separate them out. Uh, there was unit number two, the, the uh, back of the hand. Here's unit number three, the phalanges or the fingers. Unit number four would be the carpal bones of the thumb itself at quite a different angle. There, there, there it is, there, a sort of triangular shape there, uh, but still with a sort of square profile. And then its own uh, strange uh, wiggly thing, but, but with the thumbnail at quite a different angle from the fingers. And this bit of webbing, which joins finger to thumb, finishing the job off like this. One, two, three, four, five. Five units that make up the hand. Um, we'll have a look at other views, but these are the, the units I think you must always see. Whenever, I, whenever you look at a hand, try not to do what I would call the other hand. One, two, three, four, five. Or some variation of that. No, 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 no. Always see this, then this, then these, then this, then this. Try to see the different units, and that way you'll be able to cope with the complex arrangement of the hand, because it can get into the hand, the fingers and thumb, the hand itself, can get into all sorts of strange uh, computations, arrangements, and only by seeing the different units can we make any sense of it. I'll talk about the palmer side of the hand uh, now. Um, it's the same but different. <laughs> uh, again, there are uh, five units, but um, strangely enough, uh, the fingers look a little bit less elongated from the palmer side because there's a web uh, between the fingers, uh, making, the, making them f appear rather s shorter on the palmate side than they do on the back of the hand. But the same um, units, as I say, exist. One, which is the radius and the ulna. And then, as I say, all sorts of arrangements can occur. Let's do it slightly like this. There's the thumb. Completely different limb, as it were, from the hands, which could be in any direction here, held together. Uh, but there's a pad of fat and muscle there, uh, there's there and there. So there's that wonderful arrangement on the palm of our hand where we have these uh, areas of muscle and fat. And then, in a, in a, in a simple form, the, the digits seem to curl in towards each other in a spade-like. Okay. One, two, three, four. So they're less wiggly uh, seen from the palm side, uh, and together they form this uh, rather beautiful inward pointing spade-like shape, which of course is very handy for us to grasp things. And the palm of the hand is slightly hollow because as we saw uh, on the back of the hand it is rather convex, whereas slightly concave on the inner view. And then we have all sorts of um, tendons, carpal tunnel here, carpal te tendons, that always form a little sharp note there. But again, one, two, three, four, 
five units. Try to see, try to distinguish between these different units as we draw. Let's consider other, let's consider other uh, positions of the hand um, using this idea of the units. Let's try one here. Um, because the hand is capable of extraordinary geometry, really, uh, that you'd hardly believe. Um, always seeing the thumb as a separate unit. Again, the fingernails, the thumbnail, help to establish the, um, the plane, the thumb being at right angles to the fingers, the fingernails. Um, let's try one here, let's think of this. Just making this up. We are so used to seeing our hands in all sorts of positions. Ah, what am I doing? Let's see. It's rather beautiful. One, oh sorry, one, two, three, four, five. Um, as I draw, I'm thinking of the various uh, units that make up the digits and here the thumb. This might or might not be successful, we'll see. So here's another uh, position uh, where the hand can, can be seen in, in, in ways that uh, are difficult to draw unless you follow the units. Let's see if I can make this up. Um, Always thinking of the fingernail as helping me to see which plane I'm on. Now the thumb is coming towards us, so I have to be careful. Where's the thumbnail? Down here somewhere. As I draw, I'm thinking, am I drawing finger? Am I drawing, the, in this case, the palm of the hand, the wrist? I'm always thinking of units. One, two, three, four, and maybe a little bit more articulated. Five. Five units in all sorts of extraordinary dispositions. So when we talk about the foot, uh, much the same uh, pertains as when we were talking about the hand and the wrist. Uh, the same sort of structure, perhaps less flexible uh, than the uh, hand, uh, more constrained. But it's important again to see the foot uh, in terms of units, it seems to me. Um, we can name a few names if you like, but it's going to be units that's going to help us to draw it. The two bones that are the equivalent of the radius and the ulna are here the fibula and the tibia. The tibia is more fixed. The fibula, well, the two of them are quite fixed in, the, in, the, in terms of the ankle. Um, the tibia 
falling a little bit lower on the outside angle than the tibia on the inside. Um, so that's unit one. Unit two is the uh, tarsal bones and the metatarsals. They make an arch like that. Uh, I'll describe that later. Uh, then there are the toes set out, which tend to be slightly bent forward like this as we, uh, as we walk. But again, like the thumb, I would like you to see the, the, the bones of the big toe as a separate unit and to draw them separately. Um, I'll show you what I mean. Tibia and fibula could be seen as a unit right like this. Ah, together, they don't move very much. Like that. I'm going to call that one and two, I think. Yes, one and two. And then coming through between them, they're like a sort of stirrup, and coming like a, well, it is in fact an arch between them, thrusting forward here, the arch of the, the tarsal bones and the metatarsals, but they reach behind to this wonderful bone, the oscalsis, or the heel bone. Here it is here. Look at it. Massive bone there, which anchors us to the ground. Um, and of course, this is a very rough bit of bone there, of course it is the bone into which the Achilles tendon zonks, fits like that. And so when we draw, the Achilles tendon is always going to be something with some, some tension, something sharp and crisp. We need never draw the Achilles tendon in a, a sloppy, floppy sort of way. So there we are. Uh, this, these bones of the, of the foot uh, reach forward like this. And then the eye is brought between the big toe and the little toe. Here, I'll, I'll, in this case, I'll draw an instep. So, uh, just as you might do looking at uh, a pair of, uh, what, what do you call them, uh, flip-flops, uh, where the toe is uh, separated by the thong between them. Where my finger is here just now. Always see that point. Try never to draw the uh, foot and the toes all in one go. It, it, it just n never works. You've got to lift your pencil, separate them out. So uh, there's that point between big toe and little toes. In this case, the big toe with this big joint uh, comes from behind the hill, shall we call it, of the arch of the foot. Like that. And then the little toes follow. And in this case, the outside of the uh, foot, there is a, a pad of fat and thick skin uh, forming a, a straighter line at, at the, where the foot meets the uh, floor. One, two, three, four, five units. Uh, let's draw this now from the other side, the instep, that is the outside of the foot. Uh, let's draw this the other round. One, two, oscalsis, three, like this. Here, the sharp line of the Achilles tendon. Here, the, uh, the ankle bone, like this. The other one, now obscured by the arch of the foot. But in this case now, the big toe uh, is visible and has a joint there. And just like we saw that wiggle with the, the fingers, so with the big toe, or with all the toes, there's a wiggle as each joint uh, gives a, a bump and between the joints there's a kind of waist, shall we say. So there we are. And in this case, there's a more or less of an arch like this. And then from behind here come the big toes. Now, there are, everyone's different. Uh, some people have uh, a big toe which is, uh, sticks out much further than the other toes. And for others, they are very close in size. Um, we're all slightly different and you just make your observation as you draw the specific model. But, but you can see the pattern I'm talking about here. One, two, three, four, 
and 5. Let's consider some more um, stranger views. Uh, um, I'll just change paper. The foot, we tend to look down from a uh, standing position or a sitting position, down on the model's feet, and the feet tend to be coming very often coming towards us. So there's these problems that I talked about earlier about uh, foreshortening, about a cylinder coming towards us. We'll see that in the toe. So, see the foot from a frontal view. Uh, same things pertain, ankle bone, ankle bone, and between them, the arch of the foot coming towards us. You may or may not see a little hint of the heel behind that. Then the big toe, again, seeing it as a separate unit, the nail helps us, the big toes nail helps us to see where we are. One, two, three, four, and then the smaller toes. One, two. Let's see from another point of view. Um, strangely, from behind, it's slightly weird. The Achilles tendon comes down between the two ankle bones to the massive bone of the heel bone or the calcineum or the bone of the heel. And then, let's see, this is the big toe. The big toe would be seen going off into the distance like this. And so we get our view of the foot from behind. Not, not very edifying, really, but uh, that's rather how we would see it. One, two, three four and five if possible. Try to keep all these units in your mind as you draw. You could even add the Achilles tendon as a separate unit because it is so characteristic of the human foot. A sharp, sharp tendon zonking down into the oscalsis or the, or the heel bone. There we are. So I found that paying attention to uh, drawing the hands and feet well, it's very helpful in, in an expressive sort of way. Uh, we're all used to reading faces, smiling, frowning, bored, whatever. And we've talked earlier about uh, mouths and eyes and how expressive these uh, features are uh, in, in our work. But don't neglect the hands. Um, very often you'll find what a model does with the hand reinforces or maybe contradicts uh, a sentiment, a feeling, and is very often a compliment to a portrait, and uh, very often drawn rather badly. Uh, and, it, and so by simply by studying a little bit and, and practicing it and thinking, as I would suggest, in terms of these units and how they're put together, you can use something which is often rather difficult to paint and to draw. Uh, you could use it to your advantage to make your portraits, to make your drawings more expressive. Because as human beings looking at the work, we read expression through eyes, facial expression, of course, mouth, uh, but also by what the hands are doing. 